um, we thought it'd be a good time to to talk a little bit of of the Jets and uh, coming off our conversation of uh, this this list of potential available available goalies. And how do you not put Hellebuck at the top of the list, right? Oh yeah, no doubt. I mean, if you're you know, there's so many teams out there that are thinking if we could just, if we could just get a goaltender, that would be the finishing piece. Connor Hellebuck isn't just that. This is a goaltender that has kept the Winnipeg Jets alive for a number of years and, and had them, you know, in playoffs and probably a number of years. I think this year you can include that. I think the play-in year uh, are years that, the Jets, the, their numbers would tell you that they weren't a very good team, but Connor Hellebuck just kept them in it. So you're not just talking about a goaltender that's like, you know, we're L.A., we're a pretty good team. If we get out of goaltender, we could compete. You're talking about the kind of goaltender that can take a mid-range team and make them an upper-level team if he continues to do with that team what he's done with the Winnipeg Jets. So this is really one of those trades that if you can pick up this goaltender – you know, I, I don't want to put him way too high up there, and it's funny to say that considering he's in Vesna contention for so many of these years and has a Vesna. But, like, you take a look at way back in the 90s, a trade like the one that sent Color, uh, uh, Patrick Watt to Colorado, that entirely changed, you know, the face of that franchise and what they were capable of. You know, I'm not putting him at Patrick Watt's level yet. He's got a ton that he has to prove in his career to get there. But there's potential for this to be that kind of deal. A team could go pick up this player, sign him long-term, and have him around. He could be the backbone, the very foundation of an organization that could have a ton of success just based on the idea that you've got a goaltender that time and time again has shown you he can steal games to the degree that he makes a team look a lot better than it actually is. So he may be the crown jewel in terms of trades, or maybe Dubois. You know, there's Shifley, there's Wheeler. We were. T- Go Can ahead. I just ask one more yeah, goalie question yeah, on yeah. Hellebuck? Yes. Okay, um, and I'm going to ask you this too as well. Okay, you mentioned sign him. Uh, is is he? Does he have a strong argument to be a ten million dollar goaltender like Bobrovsky or Carey Price before he shut it down? Oh, I think he entirely does. I, you know, based on I, I, I still I would not put him where uh, Carey Price got to in his career. I mean, Carey Price is a goaltender who made the Canadians relevant for a lot of years where they shouldn't have been relevant. Connor Hellebuck has done similar things with Winnipeg. I just don't think to the degree of Carey Price. Um, I I mean, I would definitely put him in the Bobrovsky range, what I've seen Bobrovsky do in his career right now. If I would pick the two more impressive careers, I would pick Connor Hellebuck. Um, I guess the question for him, and, and he has said this, I mean, it's the reason we're talking about him moving on because at the year end, he basically said he wants to be somewhere where he can compete. Uh, you, you talk to him time and again, what does he need to prove in his career in the playoffs, blah, blah, over and over. He has said this consistently to me for years. He just wants to win that cup. That's He's entirely singularly focused on winning a cup. So he wants to go someplace where that's going to happen. Well, I think if you're a player that kind of, puts that idea first. Sometimes you have to say, do I want to be a $10 million goaltender on a team that has a chance of winning the cup? Or do I want to be an eight, $8.5 million goaltender on a team that's going to have a really good chance of winning the cup because I've left a little bit of money on the table. I, I I've never had this conversation with him, but I do know that Connor Hellebuck is so singularly focused on that, that if he found the right situation, I could see him, backing off the money a little bit just to make sure the team that he was with had enough left behind that it could compete for what he, you know, truly wants to win. And he has no uh, trade protection, I believe, so he could go anywhere, right? But presumably he would, they'd trade him somewhere where they know they could get him resigned. Well, if you want to maximize the return, and I do think that this, of all the players, you know, you were, you were just touching on it. He'd be the crown jewel for what, the Winnipeg Jets have it. Everything else seems to come with conditions. Like Pierre-Luc Dubois is a situation where the Jets just do not have a lot of leverage because of where he likely wants to go. The fact that he's only got one more year of team control left. I mean, Pierre-Luc Dubois seems to have spent the majority of his career in places that he doesn't want to be. He's one year away from going you know, choosing his ticket and going to where he wants to go. It seems like he's going to exercise that unless the Jets expedite the process. But, you know, we're hearing different stories. Of course, Jeff Merrick today talking about the New York Rangers and and the Minnesota Wild, which to me, 
I don't know if that's just like, if that's coming from Pierre Luc Dubois' camp, it seems like it's them messing with the Winnipeg Jets, giving them an option that's not really an option because the last thing the Jets want to do is stare down uh, I-95 highway and head down to Minnesota and get blanked for the next eight years uh, <laughs> against Connor Hellebuck, right? But if he truly does want to go to Montreal, Montreal, I don't think, thinks it's winning the Cup this year. Uh, so there's really not a rush to get him there. So they don't have to give up a lot. And if there's not a lot of competition because he's not going to accept competition, that puts them in a tough spot. The Shifley potential trade, I mean, I think people look around the league and see he can put up good numbers. But I think when you watch his game, people question, you know, his commitment to, to you know, a defensive style of game. So I think anyone who's picking up Shifley kind of feels like they need to bring him in and make sure he can fit in with their culture and kind of get back to the kind of hockey he was playing for years, even though he still puts up points with ease. But Connor Hellebuck is one of those absolutely flawless assets. If you go get Connor Hellebuck, you know exactly what you're going to get. So if you're able to get him and be a team that thinks they're right on the edge, they just need to solve their goaltending problem, and you have the money to do it, He's the kind of guy that you could trade and build, you know, one, two, three, maybe four assets that, you know, five or six years down the road from now, you take a look and the team he's with is happy they picked him up, but the Winnipeg Jets are extremely happy because he's basically built the foundation of the next big run of the Winnipeg Jets. Well, it's, uh, it's a crazy time because there's, you know, you look at the guys and what they might bring back, Blake Wheeler's a name who also comes up and probably needs an asset with him. I don't know necessarily to, to trade him. I'd heard somewhere along the, the way that, you know, the reasonably high likelihood that all four of those guys could get traded before the season. Where are you on the likelihood? Sheffield Dayoff has not been an aggressive GM in the past. Where are you in the likelihood that all four of those guys get traded? Well, I think with Hellebuck, you can't risk losing him for nothing because of what we just talked about, the ability for him to bring back basically the future of your organization. Um, if we take a look, and I don't know how you guys perceived it from the outside, but Rick Bonus and his disgusted comments following the Winnipeg Jets uh, crashing out of the playoffs in the first round against the Vegas Golden Knights, I think was a sign of something we've seen for years the thing about Rick Bonus is he'll tell you exactly what he thinks. And I don't think Paul Maurice did that when he was here with the Winnipeg Jets, which is why people were surprised when all of a sudden, you know, everything seems to be going good. And then all of a sudden he walks away from the team. I think there was a lot of truth left on the table that wasn't told when he was here of the issues that were here. Rick Bonus coming in and saying a comment like that gives you an idea of what the state of that dressing room is, what the state of the leadership of that dressing room is. And because of that, I think there's a desperate need for a culture change in Winnipeg. And I do not think you create that culture change without moving both Blake Wheeler and Mark Scheifele. In fact, I think it's impossible to do with Blake Wheeler in the room because they stripped the captaincy from him, um, tried to put other players into that role, Adam Lauer being one of them. And you saw when that team kind of turned on its coach at the end of year availability, they essentially pledged their fealty to Blake Wheeler and said, well, he may have had the captaincy stripped, but he's our captain and nothing has changed around there. Well, if nothing's changed, and we've been seeing that Paul Maurice needed to walk away from this team and that, you know, the new coach is disgusted with their effort. If nothing has changed and he still is the leader, and that's the results you're getting. I think it's pretty obvious you need a new leader. The Jets, have to change their culture. I don't think you can pull that off without moving Shifley and Blake Wheeler. We're talking to Hockey Night in Canada and Sportsnet's Sean Reynolds does a terrific job covering the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Sean, the Jets relocated, what, 2011? There was a this great uh, return, sellout crowds, everything was been, been going great, and then, what, uh, pandemic hits, and, you know, all of a sudden they're not selling out anymore. Uh, Jet fans wake up today and they can see their, their, the nucleus of the team blowing up. Uh, how's this going moving forward for, for Winnipeg and, uh, and all this uncertainty? Is, is, there, is this a nervous time for, for um, the organization? I think it most definitely is for the organization. Now, I, I think, you know, based on what I've heard, I think I think very differently than the organization does when it comes to this. You hear these conversations 
that the team has. And, you know, they're talking about moving these players and they're basically saying, well, don't be offering us futures. We want to compete right now. So basically what the Jets are trying to offer is, you know, a bunch of players on expiring contract. They want to trade you, Mark Shifley, and they want your Mark Shifley back, but they want him signed down long-term. So it's like, here, you take our problem and we'll take your solution. To me, that message that they're sending out there, it doesn't resonate. And I take a look around the league and I think any team that wants Mark Shifley is probably trying to get Mark Shifley to put them over the top. Or Connor Hellebuck, same thing, trying to get a player to put them over the top. You don't give away equal value right now for a player that you're trying to put over the top. You give a little bit of your future so you've got a great present. But I think the Winnipeg Jets are saying this because I, the, what I sense from them is that they're worried that if they dip a little bit and they're not that a, a team that's making the playoffs in the next couple of years, that it's only going to worsen their situation with fans. And like you said, the, the lack of sellouts that they've been seeing I truly think that the issue with the Winnipeg Jets is one that that core that we're talking about, the culture that needs changing, the culture that got called out by their head coach is one that has been abrasive and rubbing on fans for a number of years now. You'll get this, Kipper. Uh, a, a team that really reflects its fan base is a successful team. So the Big Bad Bruins were Big Bad Bruins for years. They knew what their fans were. They were trying to reflect their fans on the ice same thing with the philadelphia flyers for years until you know the last 10 years or so did a real good job of really reflecting the grit of the city with their team well winnipeg is not a flashy town it is you know people who go to work put their put their effort in put on their work boots take them off and grab their jets hat and then head out to the game afterwards so when they see a team full of players that aren't out there grinding and trying to get things accomplished you know, in, in a workmanlike manner. And rather they're seeing a team full of guys who are trying to flash their skill. And when the game gets hard, they're not that interested in pushing for it. I think that that is what has been kind of driving fans a little bit away. I, I don't want to go spend $150 when I walk away from my job pouring concrete or, or you know, pounding stakes in the ground on a job site and go watch a bunch of guys not willing to put in the effort that I put in every day on my job. So, I think that what's happened here, this is my personal opinion. I don't think the Jets share it at all. But my personal opinion is that the Winnipeg Jets have kind of lost the connection with the fans of who their fans are and what they want to see. I don't think this team or this market would have any problem handling a rebuild if you brought in a bunch of young players with a bright future who were giving everything they had on the ice, even if they were missing the playoffs. That's one of the most history 2017 when Patrick Laine came rolling onto the scene and Kyle Connor we were seeing was turning into this phenomenal player they had all year. The fans absolutely loved going to the death game. I think they need to recapture that kind of relationship with their fans and worry a little bit less about the idea that fans are only showing up to see a team that has a shot of winning the Stanley Cup. All right, Sean, we're going to let you go, pal. But uh, as always, we appreciate your time. Fascinating to watch uh, these storylines coming out of Winnipeg going into uh, the draft. Anytime, guys. Okay. Really appreciate you having me on. Sean Thanks, Reynolds. Sean. Appreciate it, man.